if you've got your Bibles, we're going to go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Let's read and then dissect. We'll start at verse 32. All the believers, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, that ring is going to drive me nuts. Uh, We'll get it fixed, though. For instance, there was... Joseph, the one, the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Should we just pause and do a start again while we just figure out what this uh, this ringing in? Because I will lose all train of thought. It's going away. It's going away there. And it's almost not gone. In Acts Chapter 4, when I have been processing and praying about and trying to think about where we are right now in this moment of history, in this cultural moment, I've been realizing that what we all get to be a part of, whether we like it or not, is that we get to be a part of this moment in time when Jesus is reframing and reshaping his church. So as we are uh, relaunching and reopening and things are moving forward, it feels like in many areas of life, we get a decision to make as a group here. What kind of church do we want to be? Who do we want to be? And as I wrestle with these thoughts or ideas, I go back to the source material. In the book of Acts is where the church, the modern church, started. The power of the Holy Spirit is poured out. He comes and pours his spirit out, and the church is launched. Thousands make a decision to follow Jesus, and they start uh, meeting together. They met together in a couple different ways. They met together uh, in temples and synagogues, and they kept up the traditions, and they kept doing those things, and it started to evolve as they, as they realized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all their traditions. And then they, they also met from home to home and house to house. They met in a couple of different ways. But when, when we stop thinking about the mechanics for a moment, we've been doing a lot of that. We've been studying different pieces of the mechanics of church, and we're going to continue to do that. But when you get past the mechanics, you realize that there's a feeling, that there's a a culture, that there is this spirit of a place that is so much more than just the mechanics. So the question that we have to ask ourselves as we take a step forward is, who do we want to be and what do we want to be known for? Thank you for the snaps. So when we think about the early church, I go back, I want to be where the source material is, where the power of God is active and alive. I want to get all the way back to the beginning, and I don't think that it's unrealistic for us to think that we could experience what is written here, because it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for us right here, right now. So it starts in Acts 4.32 and says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And if I want to put that in 21st century language or vernacular, it just meant when they went to church, there was no mo drama. <laughs> That's what it meant. It just meant that everyone was of one heart and mind. There was this atmosphere of like, listen, we, like, we can agree, disagree on things. There was just this, this, this family feeling. This feeling of connectivity. All believers were united in heart and mind. I'm I'm reminded of Psalm 133. It says the atmosphere is refreshing. How do we know that it was refreshing? Because Psalm 133 says that harmony is as refreshing as the dew on Mount Hermon. And you're like, I don't know anything about the dew on Mount Hermon. But what I do know is that you can step into an atmosphere and when there is harmony, meaning not that there is a uniformity, but there is a diversity that is all flowing together like a chord in music where it's the best sound comes out of not one note, but of a whole bunch of notes played together at one time sounding something beautiful. 
So the atmosphere or the context of church is that this is an atmosphere where people are of one heart in mind, united in heart and mind, that, that we are in harmony and that when we find ourselves in harmony, we find ourselves refreshed. Because you don't have to compete. There's no ladder to climb. There's no us and them. There's we're all in this together. And we know that they took it a step further because not only were they united in heart and mind, but they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. They just took care of one another. I've got a little bit more. You need a little bit more. How can I use what I have right now to help you where you are right now? The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. Why was the blessing of God there? Well, number one, because the name of Jesus was lifted above everything else. That, that above everything else, Jesus was worshiped and praised that he was the king of all kings. It wasn't about a philosophy or an ideology or an idea. It was about a person and his name was Jesus. And they continually told the stories of what Jesus had done and what he was doing. And they shared about his resurrection. They shared about what it's like to have new life in Christ. And there was God's great blessing upon them. Also because in Psalm 133 it says that when the people of God are flowing together in harmony, that there is a blessing of God right there. So I would propose to you that this family is a family filled of no more drama. That we put our eyes on Jesus, we celebrate one another, we celebrate our diversity and our differences, and we say, we're following Jesus, and we're on purpose. God saved us for something, not just from something. He called me and he called you and he called you to where you are and to who you're near so that he could work and speak and talk through you so they could be drawn into himself. He draws all men to himself, but he draws them through you. He says there was no needy, verse 34, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and to bring the uh, money to the apostles to give to those in need. In other words, they were just happy to say, we are here to help. And when we're dissecting the culture or the feeling or the word that my wife hates the most, the vibe. She doesn't like it, so I'll use it. We'll reconcile later. We know that the vibe was good because they were just handing out nicknames. For instance, it says in verse 36, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field and he owned and brought the money to the apostles. And this isn't like a nickname, like derogatory. This is like, listen, man, this guy, Joseph, compliments so many people that we're just going to call him the encouraging guy. He's just Mr. Encouragement. If this was 21st century, he'd be Mr. Encouragement. Now, here's the craziest thing. At no other time in the scripture does his actual name appear again. They're like, look, there's Mr. Encouragement. He's working with Paul. Mr. Encouragement, he's not afraid of that guy, Paul, who used to be Saul, who used to organize the stoning and mass murder of Jewish believers. But that one guy who's known for encouraging everybody, he's like, listen, I'm not afraid of you because I was just as messed up as you are. I might not have the same mechanics going on in the background of my life, but I don't have to be afraid of you because when Jesus enters the scene, we know that you're saved, you're called, you're transformed, that you got a purpose. So I'm going to get in there and I'm going to see the good in you and I'm going to call it out. I wonder what might happen if rooms like this were filled with a whole bunch of Barnabases that just says, I'm not afraid of your background. Because Jesus is leading me and he's leading you and he's transforming you. He was so encouraging and moved that he just sold a piece of property. He gave it to the apostles in the offering. He's like, listen, there's a whole bunch of people that got a whole bunch of needs. They're running a whole food distribution program. He's like, how about we just fund it right now? As an aside... Sometimes those acts of generosity 
create a competitive environment where people go, well, if he's going to give that, I have to give something else. And that happened actually in Acts 5. It happens in the very next portion of Scripture that you can read later, you can read it at home. But what you need to know is that God right there literally took care of that situation. Because when you come to church, it's not about climbing a ladder. It's not about winning influence. We don't give to win influence. We give to take care of those who need help. We give to invest. We give out of obedience. We give as a response to the goodness of God. It's not generosity when we give our tithe. It's a response to the goodness of God. He gave me so much, so I give back to him. So what kind of church are we called to be? I got four hallmarks of a church marked by the presence and power of Jesus. Are you ready for these four hallmarks? If you're taking notes, you can write them down. If you can't see, you can use a phone and draw it into your phone. Four things. And I'm going to give you the verses, and we're going to go pretty quick because I got some news to share and some things to take care of. Four hallmarks of the church. Number one, we find radical generosity. Radical generosity. So we ask ourselves the question, who do we want to be? What do we be known for? What is When somebody hears Saints Church, what do they think? I hope that they think, man, those people are full of radical generosity. And when we think generosity, I'm not talking about church offerings. That those, are, those are important. I'm not just talking about things like that. I'm talking about, hey, I've got something that you need. I can help you with it. I'm here to help. I'm here with my time. I'm here with my talent. I'm here with my treasure. I'm here to help you, whether it's on the books, whether I'm getting a tax receipt or not. I'm just going to be generous, and I'm going to help you. We find that identified in Acts chapter 4, verse 34. We just read it. The second hallmark is radical hospitality. You're like, what is that? That's when we just like each other enough that we have each other over to our houses. And I understand that culture shifted, that we don't just go to people's houses because it's like, now I'm exposed when you come to my house. No, that's what that one closet's for. You just put everything in there and you just don't let anyone touch it. And if they do, you just apologize and you go, where's yours? We all got some baggage. I mean, that'll preach as a whole other message for a whole other day. What are you hiding behind that door? Radical hospitality is this culture that says we just love to be together from house to house and place to place. Uh, We actually, there's a great example. You could be a part of this right now. We we, we run Alpha here, which is a great um, study for those of us who have big questions about life and what's next in life. Uh, We we run Alpha and we're running Alpha right now, but we're actually launching a second Alpha Uh, So that people that have these big questions or have questions about faith or what their next step is, they can go. But this next alpha is actually in a home here in the West End. And the food is going to be incredible. No, Pastor Seb, you can't sign up. You're okay. And we're doing it this way because it's a throwback to the way the early church functioned from house to house and home to home where we can just love people and love them well. And maybe your version of that is inviting somebody out for lunch. Imagine this, as restrictions lift, that you could just invite somebody here randomly to go for lunch with you. You'd never have to sit alone in church again, especially if you paid. Marked by radical hospitality, we find that in Acts 2, 42 to 47. It's an over and above spirit. Next hallmark of this early church, which I hope will be a hallmark for us, is radical boldness. And this radical boldness wasn't politically motivated. It was Jesus motivated. You'll find in Acts chapter 3, just a chapter before, that Peter and John are going to church And there's a guy who's sitting out front who's crippled and he's asking for money. Why? Because these people were generous. There's something about generosity around here. And he said, can you give me some money? He said, silver and gold have I none, but I'm going to give you what I do have. And he prays for him. Instantly, that man is healed. He's been crippled his whole life. He stands up and he starts leaping and dancing and praising God. The truth is, he was more celebratory uh, after being crippled his whole life than most of us are when we have an opportunity to do it every single week. He was leaping and dancing and praising God. He was thankful. That's why, we don't, that's why we worship and praise and celebrate. 
But the radical boldness, they got thrown in jail for that. And the church, instead of launching um, all kinds of different uh, political filings, they go to the council, they hear the trial, and after it's done and they get released, they have a prayer meeting. And this is what they pray in Acts 4, verse 29. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. When I'm talking about boldness, I'm not talking about all kinds of boldness related to our ideas or our concepts or our rights. I'm talking about the kind of boldness that says, Jesus changed my life and I need you to know about it. The kind of boldness that says, you know what, yeah, we're at work, but you're going through the worst season of your life, and I'm just going to let you know how I got through the worst season of mine. The kind of boldness that, 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 that takes some courage for us because we got to get out of, outside of our comfort zone to go, is it okay for me to be having this conversation right now? Well, let me ask you this question. If Jesus set you free and if you knew that sharing that little piece of information with that person at work or at the office or at school or somewhere else could do the same for them, don't you think if it changed your life that it's worth taking a risk? I hope we could be church marked with radical boldness. The last one is radical obedience. Like, what does this mean? Radical obedience. And our, the verses for boldness were Acts 4, 23 to 31. The verse for ba- obedience is Acts 4, verse 37. He sold a field and he brought the money to the apostles. Speaking of Barnabas, when God speaks to us in different ways, are we responsive? This happened to be, he was compelled to sell the piece of property to make sure that they could take care of people. Maybe your situation is simply you are compelled to buy the coffee of the person in front of you just as a random act of kindness. And we underrate those moments. But when Jesus speaks to you and it becomes so clear, I want to encourage you to just take that step of faith and do it. Because what you're doing is you're refining the listening process. You're learning what his voice sounds like, and and he takes these small steps because he's so gracious with us that we say we're following him one step at a time, and we think we're doing this, and really we're doing this. So our radical obedience looks like following the voice of Jesus in the small things and not only waiting for him to ask you to do the big things because he's building your trust in him he's showing you what's possible. Now you might be asking, why do you keep talking about radical, radical generosity, radical hospitality, radical boldness, radical obedience? The reason I'm talking about this is because we get the word radical from the same place where we get the word radish. You're like, why are we talking about produce? Because you're hungry? Maybe, but that's besides the point. The part of the word that I'm interested in is because it talks about roots and putting down roots. That we would be rooted in generosity and hospitality and boldness and obedience. That we just don't have open buildings without restrictions, but we have open hearts and open relationships and open homes and open friendships where we haven't just decided that it's us for and no more. Where we're just rooted in obeying Jesus and being confident and following him one step at a time and taking care of other people and just being here to help. That we could be rooted. Because if we are rooted in these things, we start to look like a family. Instead of a place that people go and then quickly leave as soon as the back door opens. In the spirit of being one family, this week uh, our premiere is set to make some announcements, and I'm not here to talk about how we feel about those announcements because I know there's feelings all across the spectrum, but it means that there are changes that directly impact us. And as we ask the question, 
how do we want to be as a church? How do we want to exist? Like, how is this all going to work? Uh, we've been praying about it and praying as a team. We go, how do we capture that sense of family again? How do we redig re those wells? How do we get connected again? And so I'm really excited that if March 1st, they make all the announcements that we think they're going to make, that starting March 13th, we're going to move back to one single service time. At 10.30, we're going to bring the whole family together. we got more than enough room. we got more than enough space. we got a 1,000 seats here. We can, we're even leaving a bunch of the distancing so that it doesn't feel like we're all packed in on top of each other. But you can come, and you could be together, and you can say hi to that person. Because what we have right now is we've got some tribes. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're all in the same family. we got the 9.30 tribe, and 9.30 feels different than the 11.30 tribe. And we got 11.30. Then we got Glory Hills out by Stony Plain, and, and it's just wild out there. So we got tribes there, there, there. But what I can say is right here, Jesus is calling us to be a family and we're going to start building this family together. So I'm excited. March 13th, 1030 a.m. You got to get up a little earlier, but you'll get out to lunch faster. So it's unless we go way longer because there's no restraints. Let's go. Everyone's like, oh, no. I'm like, let's go. They're like, oh, no. And we think we're chanting together, but we're not in unity. We're not in unity. We are, though. We are. It's going to be great. Uh, but to do that, we're going to need some help because that means we're going to literally, in one decision, double the capacity that we need to have in our kids' ministry and in different areas of the church, which means we're going to have over 100 kids upstairs. Uh, and that's going to be awesome. But here's the honest truth. We need you. And I know what you're thinking. I did my time. I already did that. Or you're thinking, well, I'm not great with kids, but it, hey, are you great with computers? We have a whole check-in system that we could use your help on, and you don't have to do anything other than manage that computer station. Are you good at telling a young person to sit down and not talk? Do you have an, a voice that causes people to question everything they know to be true about themselves? Then you too can serve in children's ministry. Can you prepare snacks? If so, I would like to talk to you first. And then, <laughs> could you serve in kids' ministry? And it's not just kids. It's our ushers, our greeters. The truth is, if we all do this together, if we all say we're going to pitch in a little bit, then we'll all do a little bit. If we say we're just going to leave it to a few people and, and we, we just need to just let them do it, uh, what we actually have is a broken mentality about what we are as a family. That means we're here to be serviced and we're customers and we're consumers, but that's not who we are. That's not what we are. We're a part of a family and we get to do this together. We don't have to do this. We get to do this. And what are we doing? We're creating atmospheres. We're creating spaces and places where anyone and everyone can discover the same hope in life that's found in Jesus. And the truth is there's no such thing. Yeah, come on. And the truth is, there's no such thing as the junior Holy Spirit. So if you think that you're going to miss out on the good stuff, yeah, you are. It's upstairs. Anyways, there's a sign up at the back. But I think if our cultures were radically generous and radically hospitable, then we would say we're here to help. We're here to help. Okay. Anyone else notice? I got a few minutes to do this because Nathan's coming. Anyone else notice a whole wave of Pray for Ukraine posts across their social media? Anyone notice that? Anyone? Yes, Carol Lee on the front, that's it. Anyone else see that? Anyone else anywhere? Uh, I have to admit to you that I got really frustrated by it. Not because I, I don't believe in praying for Ukraine, and as I will show you in a moment, I really believe we need to do that. But because I think what a Pray for Ukraine post generally means is I'm going to send good vibes and good feelings across the pond to somebody. I'm going to put this up there and I'm just going to do it because it seems like the right thing for me to do, the right thing for me to say. But I don't put a lot of horsepower behind it. And I certainly, um, wow, apparently it aggravated more than I thought. But the truth is we need to pray and there's power in praying. And in the Western world, we've largely underestimated um, the things of the spirit and we'll just get into that quickly in a moment so what we've done is we've decided to not only pray but pray and partner 
because generally there's kind of two big categories of people. There's people who are really keenly aware of the spiritual thing, so we would lean all the way into to praying and having prayer meetings. And by the way, we got prayer on Thursday night uh, here at 7 o'clock. I'd love to see you there. Um, and we'll do that, and we, we, we really go to work on that. And then there's other of us who are just like super practical people. We're like, well, I'll just tell me what I can do, and I'll just do that one thing, and I can be done. And the truth is all of these situations are both and situations. They're not one or the other. It's a both end. We need to pray and we need to partner. So I'm thankful for our missions committee and missions team. that We actually uh, are working with a church uh, called Ark Church in the Donetsk region uh, that's been actually in hostility since uh, the Crimea invasion. And, and we've been partnering with them. They actually put in a well because they realized that they were going to be cut off from water. And they're actually giving water to everybody in their village. And, yeah. And so what our team said is, hey, we know that there's conflict coming, so let's preemptively send money instead of waiting. And so we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to give, and I'm going to invite you to give. Jen, you could actually help me out with the give slide. If you want to give, because I also, I think, forgot to tithe and offerings earlier. Uh, if you want to give in any way, shape, or form, uh, you can do that. You can scan that QR code, give your, your tithes. And then we have tithes, but then we have offerings, and offerings are over and above out of our generosity where we say, hey, we're going to partner on this. And every single dollar, oh, now if you're new to church, you can also text hello to 587-400-2010 if it's your first time. But... There we go. Uh, you, can, you can give, and there's a number of ways to give, and that money is going directly to Ukraine. We get it there as quickly as we can. And the great thing is because we're partnered with an amazing church, we can get it right there, and we can get it to the people on the ground. Did you know that their water is the only source of people being able to do laundry right now in the region? But this is what the church is, friends. The church just isn't a place where we only do spiritual activities. The church is a place where we take care of the people in our world who are most vulnerable. So if you want to partner, you can use PushPay. If you use to give that way, select Ukraine Relief. If you do e-transfer, you just write Ukraine. If you use an envelope, just write Ukraine, and we'll know where to get it, where to get it to, okay? Do you guys have a couple minutes for me to share with you just the spiritual reason why it's important that we pray? Okay, I heard the one, and that's all I need. James 2.26 says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. So if we only leave things in the spiritual realm and we never do anything, if we're never motivated to action by it, then you actually have a dead faith. The question is, do you have faith at all? If you only live in works and you never ever cross the other threshold, you're only uh, building up your whole identity, self-image, self-worth, and your spiritual connection to your creator in the universe. If it only lives in the domain of I have to do something, then you're always trying to perform for love. But it's a both and. We live in a spiritual world, and we're not good at recognizing it in the Western society. But when you're building something, if, if, if you try and, I, I mean, I don't build anything, so I don't really want, I know I'm using this analogy, but somebody here that's good at it will tell you, you gotta use the right tool for the job. So let's understand what we're doing when we say we're gonna pray for Ukraine. Ephesians 6, verse 12 says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Sometimes in the Western world, in our, in our normal culture and society, we roll our eyes at this and we're like, okay. No, no, we, we, we believe in what we can see right in front of us. We believe in the chair that we're sitting on. Okay. There's things at play. There's principles in play. I mean, we believe in gravity and you only see the impact of it. Colossians 1.16, for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth he made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. What we need to understand is while there is a major global conflict happening with major global leaders that are making personal decisions, that those global leaders are impacted by spiritual principalities, forces, and authorities. That this is how the world actually works. We used to sing this song, may we become more aware of your spirit or your presence. And today I would hope that we could become more aware and I want us to become more aware of how the spiritual world works. 
I'm going to do this. We're going to go through a whole bunch of verses really quick, and we're going to go back to the book of Exodus. You might have heard of the 10 plagues with Moses. If you haven't, go watch Prince of Egypt. Or start reading in about Exodus 10. But you'll see why I say this in a moment. This is Exodus 12, 12. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. In the 10 plagues, in the book of Exodus, God is teaching the Egyptians a little bit of a lesson. He says, let my people go. And they're like, no. And he's like, okay. And we all understand or have heard or heard the rumors of this 10 plagues. You might've heard this out in society. And it's a weird analogy. Like, what, what was that all about? Well, what we have to understand is that in the Egyptian pantheon, which was their belief structure, there was 10 different gods. The reason there was 10 different plagues is because God went head to head with each one and he crushed them. Each plague was him going, listen, I'm just here to remind you who's king of all kings, lord of all lords, who created this thing, and you're in my universe, and I'm just here to remind you that I'm large and in charge. For example, Amun-Ra was the sun god, and so he just like made it pitch black for three days. He's like, I'll show you what it looks like when you don't have any sun. I'll remind you who's in charge. It's as if he's saying, oh, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. And then Moses is, after all this happens, and they get out and they get free, then Moses' father-in-law shows up. And how many knows that sometimes when your father-in-law shows up, they're going to tell you a thing or two. And so Moses' father-in-law shows up, and he's not even a believer. He doesn't believe in, in the God of Moses or the Israelites. And he's, this is his thought on the matter. He goes, now, I know, in Exodus 18, 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Notice the usage of the word, all other gods. Now we get uncomfortable with this because we're like, but God is God. Now there's, we read it earlier that in this spiritual climate, there's principalities and powers, there's thrones, kingdoms and rulers of a spiritual nature. And God is God. In this case, the the Israelites would call him Yahweh is on top. Because everything else is a created being and he is a creator. This is Psalm 86, verse 8. Now I know that the Lord is great. Among the gods, there is no one like you. No deeds can compare with yours. Psalm 96, verse 4. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is be, to be feared above gods. Those uh, Psalm 97, 7. Those who worship idols are disgraced. All who brag about their worthless gods. Uh, for every god must bow to him. We shouldn't be surprised by this idea that there's other gods or other spiritual forces. We we shouldn't be surprised by that, but what we should understand is that Jesus is still in control. He's still king. He still created it. He still made it. Even in the Ten Commandments, you might be surprised by this. He says, listen, the first commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3, you must not have any other God but me meaning there are other spiritual forces. Now you might use words like angels, demons, principalities, powers, unseen force, or evil ones, but there are different strategic spiritual forces at work. That's what's happening in the world right now. It's always been happening. In fact, speaking of wars, we go to Daniel 10, 13, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. What? Yeah, that's in the Bible, Daniel 10, 20. Not only is there a spirit prince of Persia, the spirit, uh, Daniel 10, 20, do you know why I've come soon? I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. John Mark Comer says, there seems to be spiritual beings with a measure of power and authority over geographic areas and people groups. So when we pray, we're not just sending good vibes into a happy universe to make things, people feel good. Okay, when we're praying, we're, we're praying that those principalities and powers, those spiritual authorities would come under the authority of Jesus. That they would submit, that they might be in some kind of rebellion, just like you and I have, a, have this choice whether we're gonna follow Jesus or not. They've got a choice and they made a decision a long time ago to not to follow that plan. But we got some good news. Colossians 2.15 says, in this way, he being Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. 
Colossians 1.15, because Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. In other words, Christus Victus, which is Latin for Christ is victorious. He's already won. Now those spiritual principalities and powers and authorities, I'm not sharing this for you to be nervous. I'm sharing this so that you know how to pray. And you can say, listen, I'm going to pray into the spiritual climate of Ukraine. I'm going to pray for the practical needs and I'm going to help give and take care of those practical needs. But then I'm going to pray for the spiritual climate, for the voices that are trying to seize authority and control in the different parts of the region and different parts of the world. And this is, isn't only happening there. It happens here. It happens everywhere. But we need to be reminded, Christ is victus. Christ is victorious. So then how do we pray? You still with me? How do we pray? In Matthew 6, we just go back to the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The difference between earth and heaven is that in heaven, everybody follows God's purpose and plan. On earth, some of us do. So we're inviting heaven to come to earth that we could be in alignment with the plans and the purposes, the heart of God. Can I give you a taste of what that looks like? This is what we're praying. This is a picture of heaven in Revelation 21.4, a new heaven and a new earth. He says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's what we're praying into these situations and circumstances, that heaven would meet earth, that sorrow and pain and loss would go, that these principalities and powers would come under the authority of Jesus, that there would be peace. I sent out in our weekly email five prayer points that you can pray about. If you're not on our weekly email, we'll try and send it out again this Tuesday. You can sign up at saintchurch.ca. It's the best way to stay connected. But I wanna leave you with this encouragement. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. God can be trusted. Come on. In the midst of the craziness, in the midst of the chaos, let us hold tightly to the hope that we affirm. Christus victus. Jesus Christ is victorious. He's already won. He's coming back again. He wants to bring hope and healing and life in our everyday lives and across this planet, that he is in control, that we don't have to be afraid. And now we partner with him and we pray that heaven would meet earth. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? You might be here, maybe you're online, somewhere, anywhere within the sound of my voice, and you would say, man, I've been living afraid. I've been living nervous. I've been... I've been feeling like the world's coming to an end and I don't know what to do. Well, I just want to remind you that you don't have to know what to do. You just have to know that Jesus Christ cares for you. He's got a hope and a future for you. He's got this under control. He wants us to partner with him and bring hope in life wherever we go. And he wants to bring hope in life to the various parts of the world that are in conflict, the parts that we know about and the parts that we don't know about. And we can partner him with, with him in the spiritual things and in the natural things because he wants to do this thing together and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. So you might be here or online and say, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just feel like, I just feel overwhelmed. My friend, can I tell you? If you give your heart and your whole life to Jesus, he wants to take away those worries, those doubts, and those anxieties. He wants to give you a peace that doesn't make sense. He wants to walk with you. Things are always going to be bumpy. Troubles and trials will come. But this time, you can hold the hand of the one who holds the world. So if you're here today, and you say, yeah, that's me. I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I want you to get out your phone and text the word Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, to 587-400-2010. It's on the screen right 
now. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, text the word Jesus to 587-200. Sorry, 400-2010. If you're in the room like, I don't want to do technology, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count down from three, and nobody's looking around. This is a private moment between you, me, and the creator of the universe. If you say, yeah, I want to make that decision today, and you're in the room and you're not online, I'm gonna count down from three. When I get to one, you just give me a real quick wave, just like a ninja fast wave. Say, yeah, that's me. I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus today. So if that's you, you wanna put your hope and trust in Jesus, start a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. Give me a wave in three, two, one. Quick wave, quick wave, quick wave. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else, anybody else? Quick wave, ninja wave, ninja wave. Thank you, anybody else? Quick wave, quick wave, quick wave. All right, church, let's all pray this prayer together. We're gonna do it at the same time because we're all in this together. We say, dear Jesus, I need you now more than ever. So I give you everything, my wins and my losses, my sins and my successes, they're all yours. From this moment forward, I'm following you one step at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, come on, let's give a big round of applause for those who prayed that prayer for the very first time. Hey, if that was you, we got a special gift for you. We've got a Bible that we'd love to give you at the Connection Center in the lobby. Otherwise, text us and we'd love to help you on your next steps. Hey, before we leave Saints Family, I just want you to know that we got Alpha at home. If you have questions or if you know someone that has questions about God, head over to saintschurch.ca slash groups. There's a button and you can see a list of all the groups we have, women's groups, men's groups, all sorts of groups. Uh, and you can see that there's Alpha at home. Click that and you can participate. Come on now. If you have any questions, head over to Alpha at home. But hey, church, Sunday service might be over. But church is just getting started. We'll see you next Sunday. We love you. We appreciate you. Please come back soon. We'll see you.